Hello, my name is John Griffiths. I'm a lead environment artist here at uh, Star Citizen at Cloud Imperium. I'll do that again. Uh, <laughs> Hi, my name is John Griffiths and I'm a lead environment artist at Cloud Imperium Games. I'm heading up EU Sandbox 2 and we're working on the revamped underground facilities which you saw at CitizenCon. This is also my first ISC episode and it's also the first in our lovely new office. So I hope you enjoy. So after we've gone through that kind of concept development phase where we're just fleshing our ideas, it's time to kind of think about what actually the underground facilities are going to be. How much time is the player going to be spending there? What are they going to be doing there? Um, how many they're going to be? What kind of themes they're going to be? All that jazz we need to think about and we also need to plan out how we're going to do it. So when we're in the stage of very early on in development, it's about kind of iterating quickly, getting into the editor, getting feedback on what we're doing, playing the location as a complete thing as fast as possible. Because only when we see things in context of what they're going to be, can we really make actual um, great decisions on what it is we're making. And this is a collaboration between art and design, mission content, the directors are involved. It's um, just molding the beast into something tangible, which we can then take into our planning stage to iron out what it is we need to create and how we're going to create them. So we've come out of pre-production. We now need to get a plan together so that the team can start working. So at the moment, we can see all these boxes. All the ones on the top are rooms. All the ones underneath are overlays. So overlays give us that variety. When the team looks at this, they don't have to come to me to ask, does the surface structure medium need work doing to it or not? Um, they can read it for themselves here. This is great because it gives us a big overview of what's required for the location. And it also means that we can break it down into kind of uh, content packs. So our tier zero is everything that we would need to release this into the universe with some variation. Our, t our tiers after that, kind of our additional content, which might flesh out some of the UGFs or give it a new theme or that kind of thing. So some of the rooms that are in production at the moment, let's just skip over to them. So this looks like um, one whole thing. It's actually two things. So it's the surface structure, which is this little, this guy in the middle uh, and this kind of surrounding hangar. You know, how do you actually get there? Um, we've also got our physical elevator spaces. So if we go from the top, this is where you trundle down into the UGF on a lovely diagonal elevator. We've got the elevator shaft components themselves. So you might have really long elevator rides. You might have really short ones. And then the way you end up um, at the bottom of the elevator ride, you know, this room is currently in progress as well. This is a more refined plan to begin with but we still need to get into the actual numbers of how much time this will actually take to make. So then we come to our trusty uh, Microsoft Excel. And in here, this is um, just really just put in estimates on how long we think things will take. So for us, that's um, in this next phase, which is white boxing, we want to block the rooms out, we want to add content, we want to get the gameplay in there, we want to split things into overlays, test it with our ProcGen tool and get all that done. So we estimate this like this, and we put in all of those rooms that we called out before. We've got all the room types it can be and how big or small the thing is. So using this kind of grid, we can call out, well, there's uh, one room that's got a retheme. There's uh, two rooms which are medium or large that needs to be done, and this calculates how much time is required. So you can look at it from uh, room type, you can do the time that way, or you can look at how many medium rooms will it will take, you know, we can do it that way as well. This calculates it all, puts into a lovely little um, table, um, and then we can also call out how many artists there are, how many designers, um, how many days per artist, uh, how many total days for a sprint, blah, 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 get all of that done and um, that gives us our kind of ballpark figure to, to, to go with, to begin with. Um, I think I might have to retake this. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 you, you're doing good. Uh, at what point do Ooh, we ignore all this? At what point do we ignore all this? Okay, so it's all great having all of this, and it gives us a really good 
plan to begin with going forward. Uh, but as you probably know, game development isn't really a concrete process. You can have all the numbers in the world, but you'll still have things that kind of crop up out of nowhere. That is what game development really is. So from this point now, we can get back into the editor. We can start fleshing out these rooms. We can start doing these overlays. We can start finding the variety and, and really bringing these uh, new underground facilities to life. The new underground facilities first seen at this year's CitizenCon Showcase have already moved into production with designers and artists alike building out the currently specced out 93 different rooms and 196 overlay variations necessary to place them throughout the existing Stanton and upcoming Pyro Star system. But while that's still many months away yet, let's go ahead and turn our attention to something coming in this December's Alpha 318 the imminent arrival of the next exciting parts of our new Gen 12 renderer. Now, bringing with it our collective hopes for improved performance, let's go now to Sylvan in our Frankfurt studio, who's got an update for us on the current progress. Hey everyone, I'm Sylvan. I'm engine programmer here at CRG, working on Gen 12 for the past years, and I'm incredibly excited to share with all of you the latest progress we've made on Gen 12. But first, um, let's get everyone on the same page uh, real quick and explain what Gen 12 is, what it's not, and what it's trying to solve. This will just stretch the surface though. Um, for a deeper look, I highly recommend watching our last year's CitizenCon progress update on Gen 12 and Vulkan. So Gen 12 in a nutshell is our new renderer. And we came up with this name as a natural step forward from DirectX 11 which Star Citizen right now pretty much all of you are using when playing the game. DirectX 11 is a graphics API which our engine interacts um, to make use of the GPU and renders all of Star Citizen's beauty. How fast a game engine can feed the graphics API or the GPU with rendering commands is dependent on two factors. First, the CPU performance and second, the implementation of the rendering engine. And the latter is what Gen 12 is all about. It is from the ground up a complete redesign of our old rendering architecture, which decreases CPU submission time massively. The end goal of Gen 12, however, is to make use of a new graphics API called Vulkan, which will boost performance even more and also allows us to add new cool features like AI scaling, ray tracing, efficient multi-view rendering for VR, and Linux support, and more. This meant, however, we had to rewrite every single graphics feature and ensure that it's running smoothly and as expected on this new architecture. A daunting task, which takes years in a game like Star Citizen with its hundreds of different shaders, thousands of materials and dozens of features actively used in production. You've seen our first milestone mid last year, 2021 with patch 3.14, when we had a few post-processing effects running on Gen 12 by default. This proved that our new rendering architecture was working as intended and we could start heavily focusing on the scene object rendering which is the biggest and the most time-consuming task for Gen 12. Almost a year later, with 3.17, we hit our next big milestone and could turn on Gen 12 for all our static geometry, including all scattered um, terrain objects. That was also the time when a lot of people saw an actual meaningful performance improvement in Star Citizen. Although, to be fair, that patch Gen 12 was just one of many optimizations we employed there. The thing is, since then, the engine is running in a sort of mixed mode, which means most of the code is running through legacy and just calls into Gen 12, which is ported and works at the moment. This actually adds an additional overhead and is the reason why I didn't expect anything of a big performance improvement um, the last patch and we didn't show anything or didn't announce anything. But I'm happy to announce and very proud 
that we're nearly done with porting absolutely everything to Gen 12. And not just the scene object rendering, but also our new pass centric rendering system. As we speak, we're fixing the last few things to get it fully ready for 3.18. This is not a promise, but we're working hard to make it possible. Also keep in mind that this first version of Gen 12 is just a it just works version. We haven't even started optimizing it yet at all. And you can expect huge improvements the following patches up until we can finally start making use of Vulkan. Enough talking. Let's hop into the engine and take a look at a couple scenes while I'm explaining a few things to set reasonable expectations. Keep in mind that all of these tests are done in debug builds with one set of hardware and can result in a totally different experience on a different machine. Also note that Gen 12 primarily boosts CPU performance. So if you have a weak GPU or playing in very high resolutions, which is really demanding for GPUs, your game is probably GPU bound and you won't see much of a benefit. Okay, so let's take a look at the scene here in Orson, which is well known to be one of the most expensive cities in game right now. Before we start, please do me one favor and don't look at the FPS because this is a highly unoptimized build with highly unoptimized code and very expensive debug tracking. So any discussion about FPS here is completely meaningless. All right, so on the right side, we have this D3D API call info window, which tells us precisely how many draw calls and how many API calls we do every frame. This is the work the engine has to do to send commands to the graphics driver, which determines how fast the CPU can feed the GPU with commands to render our frame. This is pure legacy mode. We have 47,000 API calls and let's switch it to Gen 12. So this is Gen 12 mode. The API calls drop to about 33,000, which is quite significant for literally rendering the same scene. Okay, let's take a closer look behind the scenes. Well, let's take a look at this optic capture from that scene on Orson. Optic is a very helpful tool for us developers to get a very detailed understanding of what's going on in our engine. This includes what every thread is doing and when it is doing it. So let's take a look at the main and render thread, which are relevant for us in this context. Let's zoom in. And let's take a look at one of those frames here. So at the top, we've got the main thread. The main thread is what you could say the heart of the whole engine. It pretty much orchestrates everything like when, it, when entities get updated, when physics get calculated, when do we render, and so forth. One of the main tasks is to figure out which objects are in our fear system and which objects we want to render. This is what the main thread does on top of here. Once we figure that out, all that work is pushed into a queue to be processed by the render thread. At the bottom, we've got the render thread. And this is a very CPU intensive task, which is why it is leveraged by a completely dedicated thread. So what we can see here is that the render thread takes an immense amount of time to process one frame. In fact, it's so long that it even surpasses the work the main thread has to do. In this context, it means we are render thread bound, which means if we optimize the render thread, if we get it to run faster, we will see more FPS on the screen as long as we are not GPU out. So let's take a look at a Gen 12 frame.
So here we've got a tent wall frame. Now the opposite is the case. The render thread too runs faster than the main thread, which is indicated by this red bar here at the end. This means the render thread has to wait for the main thread to finish. And hence, in render thread bound scenarios, as long as we're not bound by the GPU, we will see an FPS increase. And if we zoom out here, we can see that every frame the render thread is quite faster than the main thread. And yeah, waits up to 20 milliseconds on some frames. Whereas in Legacy, yeah, the opposite is the case and the main thread has to wait. To summarize, with the current Gen 12 renderer, we saw a tremendous amount of API call reduction than before and depending on the seed, a 50 to 100% faster render thread performance. Let me emphasize again that all these numbers are not final and we haven't been optimizing Gen 12 at all yet and you can expect more improvements in the future. It also depends highly on the hardware you're running at, so once it hits live and you're using it, let me know how it's working for you. So what's coming next, you may ask? Well, once we're fully done with Gen 12 and we can actually run Vulkan, there's still a lot of optimizations we have to do, like co actually completely getting rid of the render thread, employ a fully multi-threading rendering approach, doing async compute, and so much more. This guy is the limit here. And since we're developing Vulkan in parallel at the moment, it is to be expected that once Gen 12 is fully working, it won't take long for you to have it in your hands too. But more about that in the future when it's actually ready. Last but not least, a big shout out to everyone involved in getting Gen 12 ready so far. And yeah, I hope you like this little sneak peek into the future of Star Citizen Schleinering Engine. And feel free to drop any questions in Spectrum and I'll gladly do my best to answer them. Thanks. Hmm. So what did we learn this week? Well, we learned that resource planning is an essential step to ensuring your artists and designers are working efficiently to deliver locations like the new underground facilities quicker than ever before. That the new underground facilities themselves are already in production and you can bet we'll be following along with their progress ahead of their scheduled release next year and that the new Gen 12 renderer looks to relieve much of the current CPU bottleneck in the Precision Universe, and that work will still continue after the next major milestone in the upcoming Alpha 318. Now don't forget that this year's Day of the Vara Halloween festivities are going on right now. You can check out all the details on the robertspaceindustries.com website. And if you're looking at what this new set and wondering what the heck's going on, maybe you should check out this year's CitizenCon 2952 full broadcast, which is available now on both our Twitch and YouTube channels. For Inside Star Citizen, I'm Jared Huckabee, broadcasting from inside the only constant. We'll see you back here next week.